Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As a chair of the Bensvi Institute, I'm honored and delighted to host you here uh, this afternoon, today, in this very important conference that takes place here in the Bensvi uh, Institute. It is also, it gives me a huge pleasure to thank uh, Professor uh, Dan uh, Michman and our partners in the Yad Vashem Institute, and also Professor Chaim Saadon, uh, Mr. Mar Fuchs, uh, William and Offer for initiating this workshop, organizing it, and taking care that everything will be according to our uh, rules and regulations. So many thanks for this so important uh, initiative. Our fourth panel uh, deals with perceptions, and with the different speakers, we will move from the Jewish community of Egypt to Lebanon and then uh, to Turkey. We have three speakers, each one of them will speak about 20 minutes, and then we will open the floor for a discussion. Uh, so, with your permission, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, and this is uh, Dr. Esther uh, Webman. Uh, Dr. Esther Webman is the head of the Ze'ev Vera Desk for the study of tolerance and intolerance in the Middle East and a senior research fellow at the Dayan Center and the Stefan Wart Institute in Tel Aviv University. Her research is focused on Arab discourse analysis, many Arab uh, anti-Semitism and our perceptions of the Holocaust. She has published extensively on these topics. Her book, From Empathy to Denial, Arabic Responses to the Holocaust, co-authored with Meire Litvak, uh, won the Washington Institute um, for the Near East Policies Gold Book Prize for 2010. Her, the title of her uh, talk today will be Manifestations of Solidarity, the Egyptian Jewish Community Responses to the Nazi Persecution of German Jews. Esther, please. Thank you and uh, good afternoon to all. I would like to open my, um, what is this? It's here. No, no. Just a אבל אני צריכה אור, אני, זה רק התמונה האחת. זהו. לא, תשאיר אותה. אבל זהו, אחר כך אני רק, כן. I would like, as I said, to open my presentation with a picture, probably from the end of March or April 1933, that I received from Ms. Levana Zamir, the head of the Egyptian Jewish Association in Israel, who is here today, which demonstrates better than, any, than many words the topic of my lecture. As you can see, it's a van with a big sign denouncing anti-Semitism and calling for boycotting German goods. In the same vein, Edmond Jabez, one of the, founder of, of the founders of LISCA, the International Students, Student Leagues, League Against uh, Antisemitism in 1934, and the well-known philosopher and author who immigrated to France in 1957, told his interviewer that his uncle Umberto Jabez, whom uh, we will meet later, hung a placard on his balcony's offices which were situated above the Dresdner Bank stating anti-Semitism is a shame. Civilized people denounce it. Edmond Jabez identified himself as a survivor of the Holocaust, asserting that the fate of, of Egyptian Jews would have been similar to their European brethren if Rommel and would have won the Al Alamein battle and occupied Egypt. In my presentation today, I would like to give you a taste of the responses of the Jewish press to the Nazi persecution of the Jews and highlight briefly 
two episodes, a libel suit filed by businessman Umberto Jabez against the German club in Cairo, and the issue of Jewish doctors' immigration to Egypt, which not only throw light on the Jewish activity, but also on the interaction it had with its a a Arab neighbors. Egyptian Daily, both episodes, sorry, were raised in previous works, but my vantage point is the reports in Egyptian Daily al Ahra. This is a work in progress triggered by a larger project on the Egyptian and Palestinian responses to the Jewish persecution in Germany since the ascension to na of Nazism to power up to its demise. The Jewish papers followed closely the events in the Jewish world. The situation of the Jews in Germany and everywhere else in Europe, the rising anti-Semitism, the activities of the Zionist and Jewish organizations, the international press and its reactions to the situation of the Jews, and the plight of the Jewish refugees. They also wrote extensively about Nazism, its, its successes and methods of operation. Already in mid-1933, Maurice Fargent uh, published his booklet, The Modern Tyrant, Le Tyran Moderne, Hitler ou la Vérité sur la vie du Führer, introducing Hitler's worldview and the origins of his, hat of his hatred for the Jews. He was eventually convicted for this booklet and sent to jail, to jail for three months for allegedly attacking the Führer. The alarm of the Jews of Egypt was exp um, the alarm of the Jewish uh, of the Jews of Egypt was expressed by the community's papers and periodicals. Particularly active were the two pro-Zionist papers, Israel and Loror. Reacting to the intention of a member of the German colony in Cairo to found a national socialist party in Egypt, Jacques Malek, the Loror's editor, sent an open letter to the Egyptian deputy PM already in mid-February 1933, warning of the dangers of, Hitler, of a Hitler-style political party in Egypt, especially in view of its extreme hatred towards the Jews. He compared its potential danger to the dangers of communism, stressing that it would plant the seeds of hatred and fanaticism in Egypt, a country, and I quote, where everyone lives in complete harmony. He also demanded its dissolution and the deportation of, Math of Max Dietrich, the local representative of the NSDAP. Mahler's editorials were not always favorably received by the Jewish leadership and the German legation in Cairo. Already in June 1933, Cahiers Juif, a bi-monthly established by David Prato, the, gra the, gran the grand rabbi of Alexandria and published simultaneously in Alexandria and Paris, discussed the reaction of Egyptian Jewry and asserted, and I quote, since the announcement of the first anti-Semitic manifestations of the triumphant Hitlerism, Egyptian Jewry, united in the same sentiment of solidarity, reacted emphatically. The vehement uh, indignation expressed in a series of meetings had been translated into a vigorous campaign for, bo for boycotting German products. A league against German anti-Semitism and a young Jewish action organization were established as well as associations of Jewish solidarity for providing necessary aid for German Jewish refugees. Moreover, he said, it had been decided to raise funds for the establishment of a colony in Eretz Israel for the families escaping from the Third Reich. Egyptian leaders, uh, uh, Jewish leaders, perceived the ascension of the Nazi regime to power as an earthquake, threatening to destruct not only the German Jewish community, but all Jews and Judaism worldwide, as well as all the human values of the free world. Their voice was clear and loud. The Nazi regime should be fought by all means, 
and the Egyptian Jewish community would spare no effort in, its, in this campaign. And indeed, the Egyptian Jewish community became involved in several spheres of action. The establishment of organizations against anti-Semitism, the boycotting of German goods, the organization of demonstrations and days of prayer, raising money for the aid of, uh, the, of German Jewish refugees and their settlement in mandatory Palestine, combating the, dissem the dissemination of Nazi propaganda in Egypt and spreading knowledge uh, about the Nazi regime's ideology and about the persecution of the Jews. In some of these activities, they succeeded to engage non-Jews, Muslims, and Christians. What particularly amazed me was the Jewish paper's attempt to find some rays of light in the deteriorating situation. Israel attached great significance to the boycott against Germany and repeatedly published editorials and articles on, it, on its adverse effects on the German economy. Behind the dazzling, sweeping Nazi victories, the, economy, the, or the economic situation is grave, it claimed. And the people are miserable and suffering. Soon the situation will explode and the Third Reich will collapse, relieving the Jews and all the free world from the horror of its failing regime. The same logic led Joseph uh, Mosseri to promote in his editorials a united action between Catholics and Jews against the Nazi barbarism. Perhaps the belief that the Nazi regime is beatable led Israel and others to oppose the, Hav the Havara agreement. They believed that the agreement hinders the efforts to defeat Germany. The resistance was so strong that Kakal, the Jewish National Fund, issued an appeal to the editor of Israel, published in October 1935, asking him to refrain from further attacks on the agreement. The Egyptian press the Arab, I mean now, reported extensively on the situation in Germany and on the reaction of Egyptian Jews. On March 28, 33, Al-Aram reported, among other things, that one of the Jewish attorneys filed a lawsuit at a mixed court against the chargé d'affaires of a foreign legation for his offensive remarks against the Jews and in support of the Nazi regime's measures against them. To avoid the deterioration of the affair into a political blunder, the paper wrote, the Grand Rabbi had intervened and summoned a committee of a well-known personalities in order to settle the incident in a diplomatic way. The committee convened, expressed its allegiance to Egypt and its king, and Simon Mani, who chaired the meeting, admitted that, and I quote the paper, it was not our right to interfere in the German political and internal affairs, but as free people, we want to express the indignation felt by all Jews around the world against the treatment of our brethren in Germany. On the next day, the paper further elaborated that Leon Kast uh, uh, Castro, the head of the newly established League Against Antisemitism, would meet the Chargé, the chargé d'Affaires to reach an understanding for ending the affair. The papers also referred to the protest leveled by the German legation to the Egyptian foreign ministry against the Jewish paper L'Aurore, which published a supplement including several harsh statements against the Hitlerite movement. It should be noted that in addition to the details on the boycott and the planned demonstrations of the Egyptian Jews in al Haram's article, it concluded by quoting also the official German declaration refuting all the information on atrocities against the Jews. However, the next day, 
It also quoted Leon Castro response, wondering how could they deny their persecution of the Jews when the first item on Hitler's agenda is the targeting of the Jews. There was some confusion in al Haram's report. In response to the boycott of German goods, a member of the German colony in Cairo organized the distribution of, a French, and German, uh, of French and German copies of the booklet The Jewish Question in Germany. Supported by Leon Castro and the League Against German Antisemitism, businessman Umberto Jabez sued the German club for libel and incitement of racial hatred and antisemitism, as I already mentioned. The charges were rejected in the courts of first and second instance in 1934 and 1935, challenging, challenging Jabez's right as an individual to sue against a publication which did not offend him personally, but Jews as a group. In cooperation with the British residency, the Egyptian government tried to contain the German-Jewish dispute uh, uh, carried out on its territory. In the spring and summer of 1933, it called upon Jews and Germans alike to end their quarrel and banned all open-air meetings uh, staged by either side. This is what was one of the two episodes. On May 8, 1933, Al-Aram reported that Leon Castro denied that Egyptian Jews were trying to get permits for the immigration to Egypt of 200 Jewish doctors and lawyers from Germany. There is no such intention, he said. The Jews fulfill their duty toward the German Jews and collect financial aid for their co-religionist co uh, immigrants, but they do not forget their duty toward Egypt and the Egyptians. Nevertheless, there was a real concern among Egyptian doctors. The head of the Egyptian Medical Association, Ali Basha Ibrahim, issued an appeal to the Egyptian PM, published also in the association's periodical, to prevent the doctor's immigration, immigration, stressing that the rejection does not stem from disrespect and lack of empathy for the other, but from its potential negative effect on the employment and salaries of Egyptian doctors, since there is no shortage, shortage of doctors in Egypt. Indeed, the demand for immigration permits by German Jewish professionals increased after the, the April 1st, uh, 1933 boycott, which could not be granted because there was no shortage of doctors and lawyers in mandatory Palestine. As a result, Chaim Arlozorov toyed with the idea of settling them in neighboring countries, such as Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. He raised the issue during a meeting with the British colonial secretary, but with his assassination two months later, the issue seemed to come to an end. However, a correspondence from November 34, which I found at the Zionist archive, between Arthur Rupin and an uh, Egyptian businessman, Moze, uh, Moise Mosika, revealed that Mosika suggested to Rupin that the League of Nations intervenes with the Egyptian government for getting its agreement for the admission of Jewish immigrants. He was aware of the difficulties stemming from the immigration laws and the hostility of the immigration officials to prospective Jewish immigrants. But he believed it was possible, mentioning that few refugees have succeeded already in entering Egypt thanks to, to the intervention of certain highly placed persons. These two episodes show that the local Arab press in Egypt followed, as I said, closely, not only the developments in Germany, including the persecution of the Jews, but observed with great interest the Jewish community at home. At times, 
It shared its positions. At times, it grew suspicious in view of what it perceived as conflicting interests. Naturally, the Jews were very sensitive to the public discourse and interacted with it. German historian Gudrun Kramer claims that the most widespread response of the Jewish community to the unfolding events was to meet the challenge not by engaging in politics, but on the contrary, by keeping a low profile in order not to draw uh, any undue attention to the existence of a Jewish minority with interests or aspirations of its own. Their strategy, she says, was always to urge the Jewish activists to show restraint and in times of heightened tension to cease their overt activities altogether. She even quoted the advice given to Jacques Mallet of Lorraine by the acting high commissioner Sir Walter Smart, and I quote, I admonished him on the basis that the Jews were fouling their own comfortable nest in Egypt by stirring up this trouble as their action is resented by their Egyptian hosts. It was not to the interest of the Jews to create in Egypt anti-Jewish feeling similar to that in Palestine. I beg to argue to the contrary. The Jewish response to fascist movements the steps taken and the mass participation of the community in the various gatherings of solidarity with German Jews demonstrated the community's strength and assertiveness. Yes, there were differences and not all its leaders conquered with the public manifestations of resistance. Some of them tried to intervene and settle the dispute with the Germans without any further co uh, commotion. Others tried to intervene with the Egyptian authorities, and others tried to quiet the, Egyptian, the Jewish papers. Yet, we have to remember that they had to maneuver between the Egyptian government, the British, the Germans, and their own interests. Moreover, it was exactly during this period that new political and social forces, less liberal, less tolerant to others, more religious, and more pan-Arab, started to emerge. All this had to be taken into account by the Jews and by the Egyptian authorities. It was no accident that the Jewish campaign against National Socialism was perceived and presented as part of a broader Egyptian and universal campaign for the preservation of civilized human liberal values. Here, perhaps, is the place to ask why the community reacted so strongly. I fully agree with Hagar Hillel's assertions that in addition to the natural Jewish solidarity, there were other reasons. German Jews were a model of successful integration in a non-Jewish society in the age of enlightenment and liberalism. The events there caused an ideo ideological shock for all those who believed that this model was the solution for the Jewish question. Many in the Egyptian Jewish community felt bound with the fate of Western Jews. They not only held with them economic ties, they served as intermediaries between Egypt and Europe. They acquired Western nationality, adopted Western culture and languages, and expected the Egyptian society to treat them as Western societies treated their Jews. The ramification of the collapse of this model were crystal clear from the very beginning, and the Egyptian Jews felt compelled to react and act. The boycott campaign dwindled by the end of 1934, but formally continued until the outbreak of the war. The efforts to curb the dissemination of Nazi propaganda did not nip it in the bud, but on the other hand, 
Nazi ideology did not strike roots in the Egyptian intellectual milieu. However, the convergence between Europe's failure to protect its Jews and the changes taking place in the Egyptian political and social scene pushed more and more the pro-Zionist papers Israel, Laurent, Cahiers Juif to the conclusion that the duty of this epoch is, and I quote, to quickly strengthen and rebuild the issue of the heart and brain of Israel. Thank you.